Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Registered Board of Nursing Board meeting for August 17th, 2022. We will take roll call to establish a quorum at this time. My name is Dolores Trujillo. I am an RN appointed by, the, by Governor Newsom in the direct care provider role, and I am the current board president. Vice President Mary Fagan. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mary Fagan. I was appointed by Governor Newsom in the Nursing Services Administration role. Thank you, Mary. Elizabeth Woods. Good morning, Elizabeth Woods talking, and I am uh, been on the board now for going on 10 years. <laughs> And I was appointed by Governor Brown way back when, and I chair the Nursing Practice Committee. Thank you, Betty. Susan Naranjo. Good morning, everyone. Susan Naranjo, public member, appointed by the speaker. Thank you. Jovita Dominguez. Good morning. My name is Jovita Dominguez. I was appointed by Governor Newsom in the education role. Thank you, Jovita. Patricia Wynn. Good morning, Patricia. David Lawler. Good morning, uh, David Lawler, appointed by Governor Newsom in the public member role. And I would like to extend a welcome to one of our new board members, Vicki Granowitz. Welcome, Vicki. Hi, thank you. Um, I'm a public member. I was appointed by Senator Pro Tempore Tony Atkins. Um, just a little bit about me. I have a background. I have a master's in social work. I worked in there, child abuse, sexual assault in private practice. I was a court approved provider, um, helping uh, assess sex offenders and writing reports on whether um, parents could get their children back after cases of sexual abuse. I also was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis in 1986. Um, so I've been extensive um, dealings with nurses and physicians. Um, I've spent the last 30 years doing volunteer work, um, particularly in land use issues in the city of San Diego, serving on numerous boards and commissions. And I'm excited to be here and good morning. Good morning, Vicki. Thank you for joining us. And we're happy to have you. Mm -hmm. And our executive officer, Loretta Melby, Thank you. I'm Loretta Melby or Lori, and I am the board's executive officer appointed by the board. Thank you, Lori. And our board counsel, Reza Pajay. Sorry, Reza. Okay. Really okay. Soon enough. Good morning. Reza Pajahesh with the DCA Legal Affairs Division, and I am the board's legal counsel. Thank you, Reza. All right. Moving on in the agenda to item 2.0. General instructions for the format of a teleconference call. Mark. Good morning. This is the BRN moderator. I will be moderating the meeting. To facilitate public comment, we will be utilizing the WebEx question and answer feature. When the board reaches a point in the agenda at which public comment is appropriate, the question and answer feature will be turned on and members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by inserting the phrase, I would like to make a comment in the question box, which is typically in the lower right of your screen. I will then call on the individual and unmute their, their microphone. The individual will have two minutes to make their comments. I will not give a warning as your time approaches. I will mute your microphone and will announce that your time has exceeded the time allotted. I will then move on to the next member of the public who has a comment. Please note that the question and answer feature is being used only as a means for members of the public to represent that they would like to make a verbal comment. This is not a means to ask questions of the moderator or members of the board. Such inquiries submitted using this feature will not be answered. When asking a question, please make sure the question is directed at the host, me, in the dropdown. I will provide a brief reminder of this approach at the, end, at the start of each public comment item. Finally, when board members or senior staff are not speaking, I would like to remind them to mute their microphones. If I detect background noise during the meeting as a result of unmuted microphones, I will interject with a brief friendly reminder. Thank you, Mark. Item 3.0, public comment for items not on the agenda 
items for future agenda. Can we open it up for public comment, please? We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. There I go, sorry about that. Uh, I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box. I would like to make a comment. Please remember, you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give you reminders or time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Board President Trujillo, there are no public requests for comments. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, please. Thank you. All right, moving on to item 4.0. Review and vote on whether to approve previous meeting minutes. These minutes are for May 18th through 19th, 2022, June 23rd, 2022, July 26, 2022. Any questions or comments from the board members? Okay, can we go to public comment, please? Did you want to take a, make a motion to accept prior to going to public yeah, comment? Yeah, I'll make a motion. Possible, yeah, motion to accept board meeting minutes from May 18th through 19th, 2022, June 23rd, 2022, July 26th, 2022, and allow BRN staff to make non-substantive changes to correct name misspellings and or typos that may be discovered in the document. Do I have a second? I second, yeah. David Lawler. Thank you, David. Now we will open up for public comment. We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for a comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box. I would like to make a comment. Please remember you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Board President Trujillo, there are no public requests for comments. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, please. Thank you. All right, we'll take it to a vote. Dolores Trujillo votes yes. Vice President Mary Fagan. Mary Fagan, yes. Elizabeth Woods. Woods, yes. Jovita Dominguez. Jovita Dominguez, yes. Susan Naranjo. Got it, thank you. Um, David Lawler? David Lawler, yes. Patricia Wynn? Wynn, yes. Uh, 
Vicki Granowitz? Granowitz abstains for not being there. All right, thank you. The motion carries. Item 5.0, BRN future priorities and proposals for review and possible action. Item 5.1, consideration and possible modification and adoption of previously approved proposed regular, regulatory text to amend California Code of Regulations, Title 16, Section 1410.5. This is coursework exemptions for out-of-state applicants. Thank you, Dolores. Um, Heather Hoganson, DCA's um, regulatory attorney, one of them, sorry, is on the line and she will um, uh, provide more information as soon as I uh, finish with the intro. So 1410.5 is a new section of regulation that our board voted on um, in the May board meeting. And um, the intent was to bring it forward to the NEWAC or NEWAC committee, NEWAC committee for uh, information prior to the board voting on it, but we were not able to establish a quorum for the end of April um, NEWAC meeting. As you guys can remember, we were in person and being um, required to be in person with the advisory committee, we could not get a quorum established, so we were not able to hold that meeting. We have since uh, rescheduled that committee and held the committee and they did provide some input on this regulatory language and because that input was received we are now bringing it back in front of the board for vote to accept the revised language and so just a, a brief reminder on what 1410.5 does and why it was brought forward as a regulatory change is currently the education requirements for license as an RN in California is covered in 16 CCR 1426. Within that um, regulatory language, it discusses the 18 units of se for semester units, sorry, for clinical and 18 semester units for theory. It talks about the concurrency requirement. It talks about having to complete areas of med surge, OB, PEDS, psych, mental health, and geriatrics. It also talks about the need to complete um, related natural sciences, as well as microbiology and anatomy and physiology with lab components. What we found is that um, the laboratory component of both microbiology and anatomy and physiology has really been um, a detriment to people trying to endorse in from out of state. So say they took their education um, in another state, they've been licensed as an RN and working in another state without any um, incidences, no complaints, no um, delivering safe practice care. Um, and they come to California and they're not able to come into California without going back to school and completing a microbiology course with a laboratory component or an anatomy and physiology course with a laboratory component. There was um, discussion about whether or not we should amend 1426, but instead the choice was to leave the California requirements the same and do a um, carve out per se for nurses that have demonstrated that they can be licensed and practice safely with and that they did take anatomy and microbiology and passed but they may not have had a laboratory component of that. So not taking away any of their requirements to have that knowledge base, but um, simply saying that, you know, if you didn't have the lab component of that combination course, that you would not be required to redo that. Um, we get people that come in with, uh, apply to come in with a nurse midwife or um, a nurse practitioner. They have a doctorate degree and we have to deny their license until they complete a microbiology with lab course. And so this is really just the board's attempt to, to kind of allow for ease of um, the applicant to not have to 20 years after their initial education come in and retake uh, microbiology with lab course, et cetera. So I will um, open this up to uh, Heather Hoganson to explain the regulatory process and what we're asking of the board. And I'm here if anybody has additional questions. Thank you. Um, good morning, Heather Hoganson, your regulatory counsel here. 
um, Lori has, has summed this up really well. This is just another uh, a removing a barrier to licensure um, for some for some folks who want to come to California. And the possible motion is is on your screen right now. If if the board is satisfied with this language, then we would uh, proceed to to give this language to the director of the Department of Consumer Affairs for for her review pursuant to Business and Professions Code 313.1. And then it would go to uh, the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency for their review. And then it would go to the Office of Administrative Law on their approvals to start the 45-day notice and comment period um, at which the public would be invited to make any comments that they might have. Um, specifically from the last time you saw this, um, just in, in June, the text that says, more than two years, the recommendation from NEWAC was to change that to at least two years and to mirror proof of successful completion as the language in, in both the definition and the, the action, where currently there, there's a verb gerund there instead of a noun. Um, and the NEWAC also recommended that there be a proof of practice component and that would go in the endorsement application itself. So are there any questions as to the process or the language itself? Does the board have any questions or comments at this time? I have a, just a comment or a question maybe for Lori. Can you give us some context into how often this is happening? And I know most programs do have the lab component. So it, but if you have that information, that'd be really helpful. I don't have specific statistics, but we do see it often. Um, I would say that we get inquiries on a daily basis that says, I've been denied, um, what do I do? What can I do? Um, so at least one a day. Um, and I know that I think the general understanding is that it is a requirement, but it's not. So it's simple as Arizona State University, this was when it was first brought to my attention about a year, year and a half ago our board operations um, called me in because they were receiving many, many calls and inquiries and um, student complaints saying, well, my friend got licensed in California, but I didn't, but we both graduated from Arizona State. So we reached out to the program director um, at Arizona State and had a conversation. They do not require a laboratory component for microbiology at all. Um, it's not a requirement to complete their nursing program. So um, the person that was able to be licensed took their general education courses someplace else or had decided to take a general education with lab component, the micro with lab, even, if it, even though it wasn't required for that program. And so there, there is a, a law that went into effect with the Department of Education um, two years ago where um, the schools are supposed to put on their website these programs that um, require licensure in various states, that they meet those licensing requirements. Um, unbeknownst to Arizona State, they didn't understand that they didn't meet our licensing requirements either. So after that conversation, um, we did ask them to update their website to show that if they wanted to come into California as an RN to have them include microbiology with lab. But that only addresses the future nurses, right? The ones that are being prepared later. What we see the most and where we really get the majority of our complaints is the advanced practice RN that has a doctorate degree and they come into California and they can't get licensed here because they don't meet our pre-licensure nursing education requirement. And so we halt their license. They're not able to be a provider in California until they go back to school. They can obviously um, get a temporary license but um, that's not always um, desirable for them. And um, the temporary license at lasts for six months. And then um, they could extend for an additional six months um, to have a year to practice here while they're going to school. But there's a lot of fear and anxiety that comes from that when you haven't taken a, a general education microbiology course for 20 years or so and you're not and you're time limited. So it's not all of a sudden go back to school, hit those books, 
you've got six months or a year to get this done. We do, however, don't, we don't expire their application. So typically an application expires after a year if there's no movement on it. Um, if it is an education requirement, we typically allow them for three years to go ahead to, to complete those education requirements. However, that's still three years up to, sorry, three years that we're missing out on a provider that could be here in California assisting because they don't have a microbiology or anatomy physiology with lab, reminding that they do have micro and they do have A&P. They have those courses they, and they passed them. They just don't have a laboratory component that associates them with that course. I have a comment, Dolores. Yes, go right ahead, David. Um, I am pleased to see this as a way of streamlining the process. It reminds me of what we've done in education where the credential is reciprocal among certain states and there's no need to reinvent the wheel per se. I can recall in my own experience when I came to California, being told I needed to retake a class uh, to get my credential here and my response was, I taught that class at the University of Illinois. So I went to a different institution. So thank you for uh, for this, not just being commonsensical, but having a serious impact in a positive way on our future nurses coming in from out of state. Thank you, David. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the board? All right, seeing as there are no further questions or comments from the board, I would like to make a motion. I would like to make a motion to approve the proposed regulatory text for Title 16, California Code of Regulations, Section 1410.5. As shown in the materials, direct staff to submit the text to the Director of the Department of Consumer Affairs and the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency for review. Authorize the executive officer to take all steps, make any non-substantive changes to the package and set the matter for a hearing if requested. If no relevant adverse comments are received during the 45 day comment period and no hearing is requested, authorize the executive officer to take all steps necessary to complete the rulemaking and adopt the proposed regulations as noticed. Do I have a second? Jovita Dominguez seconds. Thank you, Jovita. Can we open it up for public comment, please? We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment. Please remember, you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Mitchell Erickson would like to make a comment. One second, please. Go ahead, sir. Good morning, um, members of the board. I just had a quick question to Loretta. If you could describe whether this was a unique um, particular regulation in the state of California compared to um, licensing in any other state. Thank you. Mitch, I can absolutely respond to that. Um, the interesting thing is the Nurse Practice Act is individual to every state. So um, it would be unique to California. There is not a consistent requirement for education or preparation scope of practice or even licensing standards from state to state within the nation. So um, it, it is individual to our state and um, this is to help other people to come into California.
Thank you. Board President Trujillo, there are no other public requests for comment. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, thank you, Mayor. All right, we'll take it to a vote. Dolores Trujillo votes yes. Vice President Mary Fagan? Mary Fagan, yes. Elizabeth Woods? Woods, yes. Susan Naranjo? Susan, yes. Jovita Dominguez? Jovita votes yes. David Lawler? David Lawler, yes. Patricia Wynn? Wynn, yes. And Vicki Grant. Vicki Granowitz votes yes. Thank you. Moving on. Item 5.2, consideration of public comments, discussion. This is titled BRN Future Priorities and Proposals for Review and Possible Action. Consideration of public comments, discussion, and possible adoption of modified proposed regulatory text to amend CCR Title 16, Section 1427. So um, again, I will open up and explain and then turn it over to um, Heather Hogetson again to explain the regulatory process. So give some background on this regulatory package. This package has been in front of the board for uh, almost two years. We're coming up on our, our um, statutory deadline here to, um, sorry, the one year filing deadline for the regulatory package to be submitted um, to OAL. So this, um, this regulatory language came about when we had a California state audit um, of the pre-licensure approval process that we do for our California board approved nursing programs. In that audit, they recommended ways that we can improve. Um, there was a recommendation um, number five. We did have um, multiple recommendations. And number five was that they wanted to make sure that the BRN was using up-to-date, accurate, and objective information to inform the board on enrollment decisions and to assess clinical capacity for student placements. Um, they said the BRN should do the following revise its regulations to require nursing programs to report any changes they make to the use of their clinical facilities within 90 days of making a change and report annually if the program has made no change. So that is how we started in this process and um, developed the regulatory language that you will see in the package below. This regulatory language was presented to the board initially in November of 2020. Um, so coming up on two years there, um, the board approved it. It did get reviewed. It went all the way up um, to DCA to agency. We did get some feedback um, and we brought it back to the board on um, uh, November 12th, 2021, a year later um, with those revised suggestions from um, agency. And because they were um, considered substantive, we brought them back out and did another 45 day comment period. And that comment period ended December 28th of 2021. Um, when we received that um, length, that uh, comment period closed, we did receive a letter. Um, it was one letter, but it was signed by multiple organizations. And so they, we responded to it. And the board at that point voted not to make any language change. Um, based on the comments that were received in that letter. That um, regulatory package then moved forward and was submitted to the Office of Administrative Law for their review and approval in March. What happened when it was going through the OAL approval process, OAL said this might not necessarily be clear. So they recommended us to withdraw the package, revise the language again, and make it more clear. Um, and so you'll see that that language was considered not um, substantive. So we did a 15 day comment period um, and uh, received the same letter that was submitted the first time. So it was not necessarily a new set of comments. It was the identical letter with the same comments submitted a second time. Um, and so we responded back to accordingly. Um, the recommendation is not to make changes, but I did want to address the two comments. Um, one of the comments was made about having to report changes on the contract. 
that a academic institution or nursing programs would have with a clinical facility. And their concern was that they would have to report to the board every change that came forth on that contract, including if a name of a person changed, of who handles the contracts or an address um, to where they may have to send the contract to. So if you open up 1427 and read the language within, there is a section that addresses written agreements and that is the contract. And there are only six requirements um, that are supposed to be communicated to the board. And so we would only need to be updated if any of those six components were changed um, or altered significantly. So at that point, um, it does not include um, the changing of address or a changing of um, person or um, anything on there in the regulatory language. So again, uh, we're asking that the board consider to move forward with the language that is currently um, in, in process. The next um, comment that was brought forward is the addition of um, uh, including but not limited to, and I can give you a little background on that one as well. That was actually a clarifying recommendation from OAL um, so that um, there would not be confusion with our nursing programs that we may ask for items that are um, relative and not something completely different. And so that's when you have to look at the legal definition of um, what including but not limited to means. And it doesn't give you carte blanche to ask for anything. Um, it, it has to be along the same focus. Um, and so it does, if there is any changes that come up or new things in the future, like we couldn't predict that COVID was going to happen, that kind of altered some things too. It allows us to not have to go back and do a regulatory change to address those as long as, again, it's in the same um, kind of uh, spirit of what is um, intended within that regulatory language. So we have until um, our deadline in November to submit this package. If we do decide to make regulatory changes here um, to the language, that is okay. That is absolutely something that our board can do. Um, but we would have to go back out to another comment period, a 15-day comment period if it's non-substantive, a 45-day comment period if it is substantive, and we wouldn't meet our deadline of um, having this submitted back. So we would then have to pull back um, this uh, regulatory package and essentially start the process all over again. Um, understanding that we do still have to report back to California state auditors on an annual basis to let them know the progress that we're uh, making on the recommendations that are outstanding. And this is still currently an outstanding recommendation with California state um, auditors. So at this point, I will turn it over to Heather Hoganson if she has anything additional to add and want to talk more about the regulatory process and then open it up to questions from the board. Thanks again, Heather Hoganson, your regulatory counsel. Um, you have a proposed motion on the screen. Um, the previous item was to basically start the rulemaking process. Here we are at the end of the rulemaking process. So if you approve the language as it was um, modified and noticed for that 15 day comment period, we would be able to take that back to OAL to have them finalize the issues. We don't expect any further comments from OAL because we've already run this language by them and it was uh, their suggestion that, that we worked with them on how to split. Originally it was E and then it was split to E and F. And, and so those those comments, um, the, sec the as Lori mentioned, um, the comment that was pretty much a repeat of the first comment was technically out of scope, but you do have the authority as a board to on, on your own motion uh, make any modifications if you choose. Um, as Lori said, if you did want to make any modifications, though, that would probably take us to another 15-day, if not 45-day comment period. So if you have any questions on the, the process or wording or anything, uh, please let me know. Thank you, Heather. Any questions or comments from the board members? I have one question. Go ahead, David. Uh, this is David Lawler, and I, I don't know if this is for Loretta or Heather. Under comment two, um, 
they're concerned about the word any for any alteration of clinical affiliation agreements. For the benefit of the public members, can you explain clinical affiliation agreements and how a current nursing program might use that to, um, I don't know, expand in a way that is non-regulated, perhaps? So hopefully they would not expand in a way that's non-regulated, um, but I'll, I'll explain some more on that. So right now, enrollments, which um, is program expansion, is currently regulated by our board. Um, there, there is an instant that is currently going on right now that there is a school that has expanded enrollment that is not approved, and we're, we're working with that school right now to bring them back into um, uh, compliance with all of our rules and regulations. What, what addresses clinical facilities specifically is in our regulation, it's 16 CCR 1427, and there is a section C in there that talks specifically about written agreements. And it says each such program shall maintain written agreements with such facilities and such agreements shall include the following. What the board asks for is assurance of available and appropriate learning environment and that some things, a learning environment that addresses the program's objectives. You don't want to send a, a nursing student um, to a clinical site that doesn't meet the objectives of the course. It, it doesn't further their ability at that point. Provision for orientation of faculty and students. Um, there are nursing faculty that are assigned, that are hired and employed at the academic institution that may not be employed at these healthcare institutions that they're doing their, their education, um, their clinical courses in. And so they would need to undergo an orientation. They would need to know where the cafeteria is, where security is, where to park. They would have to know what the various codes mean. What's a code red, a code blue, a code brown, a code gray, any of that sort. They would also need to know what the passcodes are to various um, supply closets, medication rooms, um, et cetera, at that point. So in order for them to practice safely, they would need to go through an orientation process for both faculty and students. Um, they would also typically during that orientation process, they receive access to their electronic medical record, learn how to use that, and they receive access to their um, medication dispensing unit, either it's an Omnicell or a Pixis or something of that sort. So that occurs during orientation and the board ensures that that happens. The third one is a specification of responsibilities and authority of the facility staff as related to the program and to the education experience of the student. What that really dictates is um, what occurs when a student is on a unit. And so when that student goes into the unit and says, hey, I'm here to help, and I have a faculty member with me that's going to supervise me and make sure that I'm um, practicing safely, um, that that RN that is assigned to that patient does not lose the responsibility of caring for that patient. There has been incidents in the past um, where a, an RN accepts a student in and says, okay, you got this. And then they go and focus on their patients that are not assigned to a student and they leave that patient just to that student and faculty. And that is not necessarily the safest thing to do because the student is learning and a faculty member is new to this facility. So um, they would still retain that ownership essentially of the care that is provided to that patient. And they would provide, um, they would allow the student and the faculty member to provide the care through a, a process that's called nurse delegation. Um, the next one is assurance that the staff is adequate in number and quality to ensure safe and continuous healthcare service to patients. Again, what they don't want to see happen here is that a student serves as a staff member, that the student, the student needs to be separate from counting into staffing ratios, separate from separate. counting as um, a person that has to be required to be there and provide that care. Um, a, a student may come up on another experience and the faculty member say, might hey, say, you know, I'm going to take you off med surge, report out to your nurse that you're leaving. We're going to go and have a conference over here or um, we're going to have you go watch this procedure in a different, different area. And so that addresses that one. The next one is provisions for continuing communication between the facility and the program. 
What we don't want to see is a clinical group show up on a clinical facility and on a unit, and there's another clinical group there from another student. That happens a lot, unfortunately, where there's a miscommunication and now you've got school A and school B on the same unit trying to get their same experience. It's overwhelming for the staff members and it's really one of them at that point has to step back and try to reschedule that day. Um, and if uh, a uh, agency comes in, if the state comes in to review, or if the joint commission comes in to review, there are some healthcare institutions at that point that will ask students to not be present. And so you want to be able to have that communication so that that school can do it. And the final one is a description of the responsibilities of faculty assigned to the facility utilized by the program. Really, what is the faculty's role? And what typically is explained in this process is the faculty comes in, they let them know what students are there, what level that student currently is functioning at. Are they a first year or a second year? They also let them know what skills they are competent in providing. And then they also let them know what is the topic in their theory course that is currently being reviewed. So if they're learning in theory diabetes, then you would really kind of ask at that clinical facility, do you have a patient that is um, experiencing signs and symptoms of diabetes or, or we can manage, we can learn more about that. And then that way it allows for what they're taught in a classroom, kind of like the STEM process that you see in sciences to then be carried out in a real life setting at the same time, complementing each other through that process. Those are the only requirements that are on that clinical facility agreement that is required by the board. Now, that clinical agreement is much larger than that. It goes into liability. It goes into workman's comp. It goes into their ability to uh, stop the contract at this point. It goes into multiple layers. That is their legal department that is managing kind of their liability and what the contract is between there. But these are only the six areas that the board has any concern with on being updated or managed. Thank you. That's very helpful. Any other questions or comments from the board? I just wanted to comment because I was um, it, you know, interested and concerned about the letter that came from those four agencies, the um, California Hospital Association, the Association of California Nurse Leaders, the ANAC, and Health Impact. Um, but I do feel that I just want to acknowledge the receipt of that and consideration of those. Um, but it seems like based on the recommendations from the Office of Administrative Law that um, that there's a different perspective on that. So um, I am concerned sometimes I feel like we get um, feedback that we don't necessarily acknowledge. So um, anyway, just wanted to say that. And thank you for helping clarify the importance of specific terminology or what the impact is. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Any more questions or comments from the board? All right, we can open it up for public comments. We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. Mark, this is my mistake. Let me make the Sorry. motion. Oh. That's okay, it was mine. I told you to open up for public comment. Let me make the motion, get a second, then we'll open it up. So I'd like to make the motion to approve the responses to comments as proposed and direct staff to take all steps necessary to complete the rulemaking process. Delegate authority to the executive officer to finalize the regulatory package, including making any technical or non-substantive changes required. Do I have a second? Jovita Dominguez seconds. Thank you, Jovita. Now we can open up for public comment. Thank you. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box. I would like to make a comment. Please remember, you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give you reminders or time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment.
board, President Trujillo. There are no public requests for comments. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, thank you, Mark. All right, we'll take we'll take a vote on the motion. Dolores Trujillo votes yes. Vice President Mary Fagan. Mary Fagan, yes. Elizabeth Woods. Woods, yes. Susan Naranjo. Susan, yes. Ovita Dominguez. Ovita, yes. Patricia Wynn. Wynn, yes. Thank you. David Lawler. David Lawler, yes. And Vicki Granowitz. Granowitz, yes. Thank you. Item 5.3, registered nursing fund condition. Uh, this presentation is by DCA budget office. Who is reporting out for them? I believe it is Suzanne. Let me just make sure she's in the um, attendance list. Suzanne Balkis, can you please go ahead and uh, promote her board moderator? She is in the attendees list. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Um, good morning, everybody. Thank you for allowing me to present today. Uh, my name is Suzanne Balkis, and I'm a budget analyst with DCA Budget Office. I'm here to present the board's fund condition statement that we currently have FM11 projections included into. If you prefer, uh, please refer to agenda item 5.3, page 17 of your meeting material. So we're gonna start with the budget memo. This will give you a general overview of the board's budget, as well as percent of the budget used and counted toward expenditure. In 2021 year and summary, the board was appropriated about 57.2 million and spent an estimate of 53.5 million, which resulted in saving of 3.7 million. In 2122, the board was appropriated about 61.6 million and spent approximately 58.7 million, of which 22.5 million was expended on personal services costs and 36.2 million was on operation expenses and equipment. Any unspent fund or saving, it remains in the fund and are available for future appropriation, which is estimated to be about 3 million or 4.7%. We have on the second page, you will find the board fund condition. We have an actual 2021 beginning balance of about 47.5 million with prior year adjustment of negative 530,000. That gives us an adjusted beginning, beginning balance of about 47 million. And we have an overall revenue of 71.7 million and a loan from the board to the general fund of about 30 million, which is projected to be returned in 23-24. And we have a total expenditure about 54 million, and that gives us a fund balance of 34.9 million, which is about 6.9 months in reserve. For current year, which is 21-22, we have our beginning balance of 34.9 million, and we have a projected total revenue of about 79.7 million coming in, and we're tracking an overall projected FM11 expenditure of about 60 million. With that expenditure and revenue, we currently have a fund balance of 54.2 million, which give you about 10.2 months in reserve. Budget year is based on governor's budget and budget year plus one is based on realized. We have no concern for this fund. Um, I'm here if you have any questions. Thank you. Any questions or comments from the board? Dolores, I have one um, comment not related to this agenda item. I believe we missed a comment on 5.2. So when we go out um, to public comment on 5.3, we can open it up for 5.2 as well. Okay. But I could have missed that too. I think I think we missed it. Reza, did you see that we had um, public comment on 5.2? Oh, sorry, this is Reza. I thought we did, we but did. I thought we did too. But I thought we did, but I don't think it hurts. Um, you know, with like Lori said, if if anyone happens to have wanted to make a, a comment and didn't have the chance on five point two, um, I, it doesn't hurt no. to, to take that now as well. You. I had 
I had received some communication that we might have missed it. So I just want to make sure that we catch that. Better safe than sorry. I had noted public comment and that the motion carried, but um, never know. Okay. Thank you. This is this is Jovita. Um, of course, it doesn't hurt, but I do recall. I think there was nobody from the public, but it wouldn't hurt to try again. Perfect. I'm actually getting confirmation from board moderator that we did go to public comment and there was no public comment. So I don't believe that we need to. I'll just respond to the person and let them know that we did go. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Lori, would it be possible that that person can um, um, do a public comment when we're on 5.3 or? This person um, was more procedure based. It was not that they had a public comment, is that they were just kind of tracking with our minutes um, and did not catch that we went to public comment. So it's oh. not a it's not a stakeholder wanting to speak. So oh, we're okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, back to item 5.3. Are there any questions or comments from the board? Seeing that there's no questions or comments, um, this is report only, so this wouldn't be anything that we would vote for. Um, can we please open it up for public comment? We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in the request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box. I would like to make a comment. Please remember you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in. I would like to make a comment. Thank you, board moderator. Why they do that? I do want to um, share some information. Um, Suzanne has agreed to come to each one of our board member board meetings and report out on our, our budget and our fund. And if there is any specific items that the board wants to learn more about or have some information presented, um, the her office has agreed to provide that education in a board meeting. So if if there is any questions or if anybody wants some further information, that that's absolutely can be covered. One additional item that I just wanted to kind of pick up on is she mentioned that she has no concern for this fund. Um, our fund is incredibly flush at this point, and you'll see in our um, sunset bill when we talk about it in the legislative section, um, the board did ask for the fee bottoms to be removed so that um, in the future, if we needed to decrease our fees, we could um, without seeking statutory approval. Um, as it sits right now, all of our fees are set at the statutory minimum, and we cannot um, drop them down any lower. So um, we do now have the ability to um, drop them lower if in the future um, we see that our fund um, increases. Right now, um, the reason that we're predicting that we're going to have this um, really great fund is because of the loan that was made to DCA that will be paid back with interest. And so um, we need to just work with that. Um, so that we don't go up against our statutory reserve. Thank you, Lori. Board President Trujillo, there are no public requests for comments. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, thank you. Okay, item 6.0, report of the administrative committee. Lori, 6.1. So 6.1, report of the administrative committee. We have a lot going on, um, so much. Uh, most of it is reported out in the strategic plan as information only, and we're not going to provide a presentation on it unless, of course, you guys do want to um, uh, ask questions or, or you know, pull any of that information forward. Um, but just to let you guys know, we completed the Enlightened License Project uh, report. We had 15, 20, 30, 
recommendations. We've implemented 15 of them, and we are currently in the process of implementing the other 15. Our enforcement unit um, is going through a review process and mapping um, to look for efficiencies and look for anywhere that we can kind of work together and streamline processes with um, OIO. And um, we just got approval to hire two retired annuitants for um, nursing education consultants that will be helping out um, with uh, the legislative areas as well as the continuing education um, provider and um, coursework approval process and within that unit so that that unit can um, be developed and hired into. Um, and we have onboarded several new NECs in the last few months and we have another one that will be coming forward soon. And so we're, we're slowly kind of rebuilding our nursing education consultant team. Um, the public information unit, those are the um, individuals that answer our phone calls and really the, the ones that are responsible for keeping kind of the stakeholders involved and um, communicated with and taking care of every one of the inquiries that come in with us. Um, they've, a majority of them have been trained to kind of do um, First hand response essentially, where they can approve some licensing applications. If um, when a person calls, they can see, hey, there the document is here, everything else has been reviewed. Yes, I can go ahead and approve it. So a lot of changes that have really been a um, long time in the waiting. And um, we're starting to see the effects of all of those changes. Um, we did hold a um, all staff meeting um, as well and um, got a really great, a lot of really good feedback from that meeting. And we will be responding to the feedback that was received and get that back out to our staff as well. So a lot of good things happening. The momentum has been tremendous. Um, it looks that like the legislative staff are seeing that as well as, as and also our stakeholders. So we are um, optimistic that um, things are moving in the right direction for us. Um, if you have any specific questions, I am here to a, um, answer any of them. Thank you, Lori. Any questions or comments from the board? I mean, Lori, I just want to congratulate you and your team. I think you guys have made tremendous progress in some of these um, in the areas that are in, in the strategic plan and uh, really, really appreciate the efforts. It would be nice to see um, the status of some of these initiatives on like a, if possible, a, like a one page dashboard or something. I don't know if anything like that exists, but just to be able to track the progress. I just think there's so much good work that's being done. I would like to get it out there on our website so the public can see it as well. Um, so just anyway, congratulations and thanks to you and the team. Thank you. We don't have a um, dashboard per se yet. I can look into that, but um, this document is out to the public and we can actually put that underneath our strategic plan right now to show goal progression. Um, so it would be easier for the public to see this if they if they choose to. Thank you for that um, recommendation. I'll look into that. Thank you, Mary. Any other questions or comments from the board? All right, um, this is informational only, correct, Lori? So we're, are we going to move on to 6.2? We would do 6.1 public comment. 6.1 public comment, thank you. Thank you. We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box. I would like to make a comment. Please remember you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Dr. Fajda Farazoli would like to make a comment. One second, please. Good 
one, uh, I just wanted to say, I wanted to reiterate what um, Mary said. I think there have been some enormous strides that have been made by the Board of Nursing and the staff has just been so encouraging and just so resourceful for the program directors that I just want to, I want to applaud you and I want to thank you for all the strides and uh, I appreciate you. And um, sorry, if, you know, I, I, I feel left out that I'm not in person with you this time around, but, um, but uh, thank you. That's it. Thank you. Board President Trujillo, there are no public requests for comments. Would you like me to close this window? No yes, more public requests for comments. Oh, yes, thank you. Moving on to 6.2, Board Strategic Plan 2022 to 2025. Um, information for this is in your materials for the meeting. At this time, we'll move on to 6.3, discussion. Uh -huh. Dolores, yeah. it's an agenda item. We do have to go out to public oh, comment. Public comment. Um, but I yes. do want to just kind of briefly on this, on the strategic plan, just so that people, when they follow through, these are six sex measures that were created by the strategic plan that the board voted to approve on. Um, uh, previously, it does go until 2025. So we, and you will see that the statuses are blank on the majority of them. Um, and that is as expected because we are only about a, a year into the progression on this. But we do have listed below completed activities and ongoing activities. Um, and so you will see those sections updated as, as we move through this process over the next couple of years. Um, so if you guys have any questions from the board, we're, um, I'm here to answer any questions on this. Um, but if not, yes, board president, we can go out to public comment. Okay. We can move out to public comment if there are no questions or comments from the board. We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in the request for a comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box. I would like to make a comment. Please remember you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Board President Trujillo, there are no public requests for comments. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, thank you. Okay, so moving on to agenda item 6.3. Um, actually, this one's yours, Dolores. I, I will do agenda item 6.5. I apologize. Go for it. Thank you. Item 6.3, discussion and possible action regarding appointment by board president of committee members and approval by the board. I would at this time, again, like to extend a warm welcome to Vicki Granowitz. And I would like to appoint you, Vicki, at this time to the Committee on Nursing Practice. Okay. Do you think somebody will fill me in on the particulars? Yes. Do you accept? Well, Vicki, um, right now the liaison for that committee is myself and um, our chief of licensing, Macaulay Pizarans. So um, together we will set up a meeting with you and kind of walk you through that process. Um, the chair of that committee 
is um, Betty Woods, and um, you can reach out to her as well. Uh, she is a fellow board member of you, and like she said in her intro, she's been here um, greater than eight years. She is on her grace period, so she is serving her ninth year right now, and um, she would be very happy to um, inform you on uh, the process of that committee and the importance of it and answer any questions for you as well. So we're, we're here to assist you in this process. Yeah, and I, I did forget to mention that I did spend four years working at the VA Medical Center. And so I did work extensively with nurses during that period, both inpatient psych and med surge floors. So uh, thank you. Try and to be helpful. I you absolutely will. It's it's imperative that we have a public member's input. And so with this, um, we definitely have set it up that there is now a public member on each one of our board committees. So um, we appreciate you accepting this. What we need now is a, a motion to appoint and a second, please. I will make the point, uh, motion to appoint, Vicki. I will second. And then we'll go into public comment. Right to public comment, please, Mark. We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment. Please remember, you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in. I would like to make a comment. Board President Trujillo, there are no public requests for comments. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, please. Thank you. All right, take, we'll take it to a vote. Dolores Trujillo votes yes. Vice President Mary Fagan. Mary Fagan, yes. Elizabeth Woods. Woods, yes. Susan Naranjo. Susan, yes. Jovita Dominguez. Jovita, yes. Patricia Wynn. Wynn, yes. David Lawler. David, yes. And Vicki Granowitz. Granowitz, yes. All right. Thank you. Welcome, Vicki. Welcome. To have you with us. Thank you. We'll be in touch. Okay, moving on to item 6.4 discussion and possible action regarding board and committee meeting dates for 2023. Okay, to um, provide some clarification, the um, committee dates are proposed on page 22 of your packet here. Um, as you guys are aware, we are statutorily required to schedule board meetings to conduct the work of the board four times a year. We have those proposed for February, May, August and November. Specifically um, in statute, it does require us to meet every three months. And so that is why it's set up on a three month cycle. Um, we will have our last board meeting in November that is scheduled. And so we do have to hold a board meeting by February. So that is why we would um, do uh, the uh, February meeting. Additionally, prior to the meetings, we do hold our board committee meetings so that um, the majority of the work of the um, board is done in those committees. We take the recommendations from those committees and then um, look to ratify those decisions in our board meetings. The two blue highlights on this calendar are when the um, advisory committees will be scheduled. 
Our board currently has four advisory committees, nurse midwife advisory committee, nurse practitioner advisory committee. Both of those are currently in statute and required. They have the nurse education and workforce advisory committee. Um, that previously has not been in statute, but that is language that has been included in our sunset bill. So when, um, and I'm, I'm talking in forward uh, positive uh, terms at this point, when our sunset bill passes, um, it will become a statutorily required um, advisory committee. And then we have the Advanced Practice Registered Nurse Advisory Committee that uh, was established in 2017. Um, and because it is not in statute, it does come back for an annual review. And APR and AC, that committee will come back to the board in November um, to seek guidance for the following year from our, our board members. Um, so that is um, those dates. Those dates, we don't have a specific date on that. We are working to coordinate those dates with the various advisory committees. Um, but we did want to put that on there so that you guys understood when you would be receiving report outs from each of those advisory committees. So if you guys are in agreement with the dates as listed, um, we you guys can make a motion to accept the dates. If you have anything that is of concern, um, let us know and we can maybe um, adjust dates. Um, but understand that if one or uh, two people can't make it, we would still be able to have a quorum and we would be able to still conduct board meeting um, the board business if um, uh, uh, something came up where a board member was not able to attend. Um, additionally, we tend to be fairly flexible. Um, we do get requests from board members that uh, they might have a meeting on that same day that our board member is meeting and we can take a long lunch or some sort like that to accommodate that. So um, it would be nice to get some feedback from you guys and, or get a motion to accept. I have a question. Um, do you anticipate that we will continue to meet remotely at least a portion of 2023? We will continue to meet remotely until July 1st. Um, that is when the provisions that were put into place expire. Um, we are hopeful that um, new provisions will be put into place so that we can continue to meet remotely. Um, Right now on this meeting, we have 105 participants and um, that's fantastic. That's, that's a huge amount of stakeholder involvement um, and it's, it's a wonderful thing to be able to have this ability to, to do that. When we were in person for a few board meetings, there was one, maybe two people at the mm -hmm. DCA Sacramento headquarters. There was nobody at the San Diego location. Um, and we did still have some turnout of virtual attendees in um, our WebEx. So um, really to have the, the best kind of voice of our public, um, keeping this in a virtual manner seems to be the most beneficial. So um, we will definitely do that until those provisions end. If the provisions are extended, we will continue to extend. Thank you very much. Thank you. Will we know the dates for the committee meetings in September? Susan, I'm having a really difficult time hearing you. What was that question? Um, I just don't see any dates for September. I see the committee meetings, but um, do you know when those are usually set? So those those were the ones that I was talking about, the two highlighted ones in um, March and November. Those are advisory committees and the dates are being set by the advisory committees. They're looking to see when they are available and coordinate that. Typically NMAC and NPAC meet on the same day. Um, and we've had our NEWAC committee, but we haven't held our advanced practice registered nurse advisory committee to vote on dates. That will still happen um, this next this next month or within a few weeks. Um, and so we will get those uh, established and they will be updated. That was, those two highlighted in blue are just information for you guys and not to be necessarily voted on and accepted at this point, because um, we just wanted to make sure that you knew when to expect report outs from those committees. Okay, any other questions or comments from the board? David, did you have one? No, I just, if it was in order, I was going to move to accept it. 
Um, and I'll second that. Is well, that in order? We need to make the motion. So the motion would be to accept the dates and location for the 2023 board and committee meetings as presented in the materials and delegating authority to the administrative committee to revise the established dates if necessary. Mm -hmm. Dates and locations if necessary. And do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you. Can we open it up for public comment, please? We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in the request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box. I would like to make a comment. Please remember you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Board President Trujillo, there are no public requests for comments. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, thank you, Mark. All right, we'll take it to a vote. Dolores Trujillo votes yes. Vice President Mary Fagan. Mary Fagan, yes. Elizabeth Woods. Woods, yes. Susan Naranjo. Susan, yes. Jovita Dominguez. Jovita, yes. Patricia Wynn. Wynn, yes. David Lawler. David, yes. And Vicki Granowitz. Granowitz, yes. Thank you. Okay, I tried to do 6.3, but instead I'll do 6.5. So um, agenda item 6.5, we have a business professions code in section 2707 that states the board shall annually elect from its members, a president, a vice president, and any other officers as it may deem necessary. As you guys are aware, um, Board President Dolores Trujillo is, is here and has served, and um, Board Vice President Mary Fagan is here and has served. Um, they've both completed um, this last um, year, and it is now up for nomination and um, consideration. So the very first one that we will open up for nomination and consideration will be that the position of the Board President. Do we have any nominations for a Board President? Yes, this is Woods, and I would like uh, Dolores to continue as president. Okay, we have a nomination for Dolores Trujillo to consider to continue her role as board president. Do we have any other nominations? Okay, seeing no other nominations, we can, if, if there is a motion to, um, Dolores, sorry, Dolores, would you accept um, the nomination to continue as board president. Betty, thank you for the nomination. Um, yes, I humbly accept, humbly. Thank um, you. Um, did you want to make a I, statement, Dolores, or do you want, thank you. Yes, I do. Um, I, I would just like to thank the board for this immense opportunity to serve as board president. This past year, I have gained knowledge and experience, and I would like to continue in this board position of president. And I would like to thank the board for allowing me to continue to serve in the role of president for the upcoming year and continue the good work that we have started. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a motion? 
I move that we elect um, Dolores Trujillo uh, as president of the Board of Registered Nursing. Thank you. And that is Patricia Wynn. Do we have a second? This is Wood. Second. Second. Woods beat you, David. Sorry. So we'll, she got we'll, me. That's okay. <laughs> we'll get we'll a turn. second from Betty Woods. <laughs> Okay, we will open it up. Um, so we'll we'll hold at this point, and then um, we will go and look at. Is there um, anybody that would like to uh, nominate anybody for a vice president position? I would like to nominate Mary Fagan for vice president. Okay. Is there uh, any other nominations for vice president? If she will accept. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll ask as soon as we can make sure that there's no other nominations. So is there any other nominations for someone that would want to serve as vice president? Okay, seeing no other nominations, um, Vice President Mary Fagan, would you like to continue as vice president? Yes, I'd be honored to continue to serve as vice president and really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Do you have any um, message that you would like to, to share with anybody right now or? Um, no, I think just, I, I probably said it previously, I think there's been a lot of great momentum uh, to address the needs um, for in, in improvements in the board, but um, also what we continue to protect the public. So um, I'm, I'm really happy to be part of that process and to see where we'll go in the future. Thank you. So I would need a motion to accept the nomination of Mary Fagan as vice president. I would like to make a motion to accept Mary Fagan as vice president. I do have a comment and it's just one comment, but you know, I work with Mary specifically really on the admin committee among other committees, but we work together in the admin committee. And I feel like our different perspectives has benefited the decision making process for the, you know, to move the board in a direction of advancement, automation, revolutionizing the process. We hear the public comments that are made regarding our board we do take those into consideration and we're trying as fast as we can um, or as fast as we're able to move in the direction to automize and make our board processes a little better for the consumer and also keeping in mind the mission of the board for public advocacy and protection. So Mary, Thank you. Thank you for doing this and stepping up. Thank you guys. So if I could, so Dolores, you had our motion to accept. Yes. We have a second. Win seconds. Thank you. So we will now open it up to public comment for the two motions. The motion is to accept Dolores Trujillo to continue as our board president. The second motion is to accept um, Mary Fagan to continue as our vice president. Board moderator, will you please open it up to public comment? We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in the request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment. Please remember, you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in. I would like to make a comment. Dr. Faja Ferzali would like to make a comment. One second, please. I just want to go on record. Hi, this is Fazia. Uh, I just want to go on record and thank you both, uh, Dolores and Dr. Fagan, for your leadership. Um, as a stakeholder, it, it has been 
the transition has been amazing in terms of the Board of Nursing and the leadership um, really assist with the facilitation of making sure that public safety uh, and as well as, um, you know, a journey that facilitates growth and development um, is being fostered. So thank you both. Thank you. Maria Dudley would like to make a comment. One second, please. Good morning. Uh, this is uh, Maria Dudley, uh, registered nurse, nurse practitioner. And I just wanted to thank the board for their dedication. I listen every time there's a meeting. And as a nurse educator, I really uh, am proud of the work that you do uh, in Sacramento. So thank you. And thank you for those of you that are continuing on as president, vice president, and other offices. And I thank the public members for the work that you do. Thank you. Thank you. Board EO Melby, there are no other public requests for comments. Would you like me to pose this one, Ms? Please, thank you. I and have I'm one more. Question. Yeah, Sorry. I was actually going to turn it right over to you, Dolores, as you are thank now you. continuing on as our board president. Thank you. You know, I, and I'm sure Mary would join me in this, and she has said this previously in this meeting. The changes that we're making with the board. Uh, none of this, none of this could be accomplished without the fantastic board staff that we have. We, we have wonderful support on the board and hardworking staff. And I would like to thank them also for all they do in every meeting with every question and research. I appreciate it. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Do we need to take a vote on this? Yes, please. All right. So, Lars, uh, for the, I would like to make a motion. Motion's on the floor for president and vice president. Um, Dolores Trujillo votes yes. Vice President Mary Fagan. Mary Fagan, yes. Elizabeth Woods. Woods, yes. Susan Naranjo. Susan, yes. Jovita Dominguez. Jovita, yes. Patricia Wynn. Wynn, yes. David Lawler. David, yes. And Vicki Granowitz. Granowitz, yes. Thank you. All right, moving on in the agenda. I would like to take a five minute break if nobody minds a bio break. Um, we can come back at 10.35? Yeah, 10.35 would be perfect. Great, thank you. Board thank moderator, you. can you ele elevate um, Samantha? She is here to report out on the Nurse Practitioner Advisory Committee, and that will be part of 7.1 as soon as we come back at 10.35. Okay, I believe we're all here, but we need to do roll call real quick to establish a quorum. Um, Dolores Trujillo present, Vice President Mary Fagan. Mary Fagan, present. Elizabeth Woods. Woods, present. Susan Naranjo. Okay, we'll come back to Susan. Jovita Dominguez. Jovita, present. Patricia Wynn. Wynn, present. David Lawler. David Lawler, present. Vicki Granowitz. Granowitz, present. Susan Naranjo. Susan, present. Thank you, Susan. All right, we can continue. We're on to item 7.0 in the agenda, report of the Nursing Practice Committee. Betty. This is Elizabeth Woods, and uh, we're going to be having a lot of information and updates on uh, various things right now. The Nursing Practice Advisory Committee, the Nurse Midwife Advisory Committee, 
The Nursing Education and Workforce Advisory Committee is going to be 7.1. And um, Lori, are you going to be doing these? Somebody we'll do the majority to. of the updates. We do have the chair from the Nurse Practitioner Advisory Committee, um, Samantha Gambles Farr. She has been elevated. And so in um, respect for her time as she is uh, currently practicing, I will lend her the floor and let her give the update for the Nurse Practitioner Advisory Committee. Samantha? Thank you, EO Melby. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Thank you, E.O. Melby, um, newly and reelected uh, President Trujillo um, and Vice uh, Chair um, Mary Fagan and also to um, Chairperson um, Woods. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity to be here today and present this uh, information as it relates to the impact committee. Um, we met on August 9th from 1 to about 3.20, well, 3.18, um, in an effort to um, continue the business of the impact committee and instituting AB 890. Um, so we started our meeting out with general um, information and improving our business um, our business as it relates to minutes. Um, we did have a discussion as it relates to meeting dates and staying in alignment with our impact uh, committee um, as well, um, our tentative dates and actually we, we voted on the dates. Um, I don't have the dates right in front of me, but they will be in March and September in alignment with our NMAC committee uh, members as well, um, and understanding that we have the opportunity to have additional meetings as we, we will start moving towards a twice a year meeting schedule. Um, we will have one, and we anticipate one meeting um, as a dual meeting with our NPAC um, committee members as it relates to disciplinary actions um, development for our two committees so that we can hear the information at the same time and um, to streamline the process of information giving. Um, the additional thing that we did was uh, we had a discussion regarding our office terms as specified um, in the impact charter. Um, we will be following suit and in alignment with other committees and having staggering terms so that we can ensure continuity and consistency as it relates to our um, committee. Um, myself and Sally Pham as nurse practitioners will carry on for four years. Um, Dr. Kevin Maxwell will be three years term. And then we have Jan Johnson Griffin who will do two years. Our physician colleagues, Dr. Edward Ray will serve for four and Dr. Espinoza will serve for three years. And then as standard, our public member, um, Betha Chanel will continue in her role for four years. Um, and that action was, uh, past as well. Um, in addition to that, we had information as it relates to the regulatory package that you guys um, pass forward and in, in the process that it will move through um, on the director's desk and then move forward for a public comment in the period of 45 days and what that timing will look like. We did have several comments from members of the public just to make sure that there would be opportunity for them to have input and to clarify what that process will look like moving forward. Um, we are hoping and anticipating that we will meet our January uh, deadline as it relates to making sure that you guys and, and have information as it relates to regulatory language and hopefully depending on the public comments that move forward, whether there will need to be any additional revisions to that language. Um, we also had information only presentation as it relates to Senate Bill 1375, which is uh, the Sunset Bill and then um, Assembly. Oh, I'm sorry. Senate Bill 1375 is uh, Senator Tony Atkins bill and then the Assembly Bill 28, 2684 is actually the, um, the Sunset Bill. So we did have information presented to us for that and for um, our committee as um, Chair and co-chair, we felt that it was important to keep an eye on legislation that could potentially change um, nursing practice and, and regulatory inf information and input. However, we're only in a watch uh, status as these are only bills at this time. Um, and then finally, we had an um, update from the Department of Consumer Affairs uh, regarding and uh, the Office of Professional Examination Service as it relates to the occupational analysis 
and that that information will be delivered to us in November. And so we wanted to make sure that we got through all these agenda items because we are anticipating um, that potential meeting in November to be uh, very long and maybe lengthy in need as far as it relates to public comment, depending on what the findings are from OPES. And so with that being said, we, um, we always as impact appreciate our um, stakeholders input, our, the public comments, any letters, emails um, as it relates. I will say on this call, there is an email address. It's impact at ca.gov.org, I believe. If not, I'm sure that that information is found on our website. And I appreciate the opportunity to present this report. And, um, and at this time, I yield the floor for any questions from the board at this time. Samantha, this is Betty. And um, could you give a little feedback as to what type of public comments that you've been receiving? Um, I would say um, the largest amount of public comment came, um, number one, regarding our terms in office um, as it relates to why and how that decision came to be. That information was in our impact charter and it is in alignment with the other committees within the BRN. And so that is the that was kind of the sense of public comment. Um, there were some comments as it relates to why our terms um, are so long. Um, however, in keeping with continuity with all the other committees, um, our committee felt like when we were instituting that in our charter, that for consistency and continuity as it relates to all the committees, we wanted to be in alignment with that. Um, the additional comments came um, as we started talking about regulatory language and what that process would be. Um, the most important thing is that people wanted to have an opportunity to um, give feedback on the regulatory language. Um, there were several members on the committee that wanted to make sure that we had an opportunity to look at the final, should there not be any revisions at that point in time. And so that whole process was very um, strategically laid out for the public to understand uh, that they would have an opportunity to give that feedback um, for 45 days. Thank you, Samantha. You're welcome. Were there any more questions regarding the Nurse Practitioner Advisory Committee? If there is none, I will move on and give a um, report out for the Nurse Midwifery Advisory Committee as well as the Nursing Education and Workforce Advisory Committee. <clears throat> okay, thank you guys. Uh, we will move on. Um, so the Nurse Midwife Advisory Committee met on the same day. They had a lot of the same um, agenda items. So again, just going over meeting dates, um, discussing terms, um, we did end up with um, four of the members serving a four-year term, two of the members serving a two-year term, a three-year term, and one of the members um, serving a two-year term. Um, it, it mirrors the exact language that is in our BPC code when our board was um, sun, they sun rose our board. And so um, it allows for the um, committees to not, um, everybody term out at the same time. And that was a problem that we ran in with the APRNAC committee is um, when uh, they all started, they all started with like the same term lengths. And um, that is problematic because um, they started and they will all term out at the same point. And so you really want to have that continuity. You want um, people to kind of carry over that and mentor um, that have some experience. And so you're not starting with a brand new committee each um, every four years. So um, that was um, presented with them as well, and they made their vote on it. Um, they also voted on dates, the same as NPAC, um, and they did agree on similar dates. And so we will, excuse me, go forward with setting those up. I know that the liaison, Macaulay Fusarens, our chief of licensing, is managing through that. They also updated um, a recommendation to um, change a, and update a, reg, a regulation. So 16 CCR 1463 discusses midwifery practice. Um, there is a uh, E underneath 1463 
um, that talks about uh, standardized procedures and talks about physician supervision. As um, we are familiar with the passing of SB 1237, the standardized procedures and the physician supervision is no longer required. And so that is the only regulation um, that needed to be updated. So they did present some language. We will get that language um, developed and bring it back in front of our board for approval so that we can go and move forward with that regulatory update. Um, there was uh, an introduction to a FAQ um, that the a committee had voted on to share with the public. And so that um, updated information mirrored the language that was in SB 1237 um, on the need. And so that was updated and accepted as well. Um, there was a really robust discussion on admission privileges for nurse midwives at healthcare facilities. What is occurring across the state is some hospitals are allowing um, midwives to privilege and serve and others are not. So there was um, a section in Title 22 that um, defines provider as a medical doctor, et cetera. And so some people were utilizing that to deny privileges for the nurse midwife. Um, I was asked as the EO to reach out to CDPH and receive some clarification on Title 22. I did. I did receive some information back, and I will be sharing that out at the next Nurse Midwife Advisory Committee. Um, and so then we'll move forward with that. Uh, based on that information, um, the committee does want to um, develop a uh, kind of a, a guidebook or a guideline um, to be able to share out with hospitals to say this is how you would privilege nurse midwives. Um, and so that is um, a lot of the future work that I think that will be done within the midwife um, committee. The final one was a presentation on enhance enhancements and um, efficiencies within the licensing department. Um, our APRN licensing unit um, is required to review all applications within 30 days of receipt. They do an amazing job by getting that done. Um, the problem that occurs frequently is that documentation that is required is not received at the same time that the um, initial application is reviewed. So they get issued deficiencies. Um, and then they have to go back and clear up those deficiencies by re-reviewing the um, process. And so um, there have been a lot of efficiencies and um, stuff made. Some of the efficiencies that were talked about is that the nurse midwife, the nurse practitioner, um, board approved programs in California no longer are required to submit transcripts. They do the same process that our pre licensed nursing programs do, and that's they sign in to the grad upload. They query the students that have associated them with their um, school code, and they provide the graduation information through that portal. That it is then um, automatically transferred into Breeze, and um, licensure is granted to them through Method 1. Method 2 is through national certification. That does require a different primary source documentation that has to come from the national certifying boards directly to the BRN. And then um, method three is an, is an uh, equivalency, and that would not be able to be um, managed through that way too, because it does require an extensive review to ensure that that meets. The other items that were updated was the furnishing license process. And so that application is online as well. And that application is, um, <clears throat> excuse me, that data that is needed to verify the completion of that advanced pharmacology course to be able to qualify for a furnishing license can also be submitted through that grad upload process and no transcript is needed for our California approved programs. So we anticipate that this will become um, a, a much needed improvement as we get everything kind of ironed out. It is recently released to these programs. There is a learning curve right now and they're moving through that process. The ultimate goal is to completely automate that um, for the nurse practitioners that have gone to California approved schools is that they submit this information, the director verifies it, and because that is the only requirement for licensure, we would like to automatically issue a license for that and not require any um, hands-on licensing staff intervention unless there's an issue that's discovered. So working towards that automation um, and really uh, working to see what we can do to improve the service so that our NPs and nurse midwives 
in the same can be licensed in a much more efficient manner. So um, that was given as uh, information only. The nurse midwifery committee, um, they went two hours and 23 minutes. And we joked with the nurse practitioner advisory committee that they beat them by five minutes. They went two hours and 18 minutes. So um, we did have a really great meeting day. Um, any questions on the nurse midwifery advisory committee before I update on the nurse education and workforce committee? Lori, this is Betty. I do have a question. Did you receive any ind indication from any of the um, nurse midwives that nurse midwives have lost their position in hospitals because of no standardized procedure or no MD oversight? That has not been communicated out in public comment um, by anybody on the nurse midwifery advisory committee and the committee members have not shared that as well, the ones that are nurse midwives. So um, they are not running into any of those issues that I've been made aware of. Thank you. Thank you mm -hmm. for the report. Thank you. Any other questions on the nurse midwifery advisory committee? Okay. I will move on to the nurse education and workforce advisory committee. This is the first time that this committee has met in over two years. This was a um, advisory committee composed of up to 29 um, people. And um, it was very difficult to establish quorum previously um, because as you guys are aware, a quorum is a um, majority. And so when you have 29, you know, you're looking at quite a lot of people to get together in one place. Um, additionally, we brought that information to the board last year and the board did vote to um, really condense the advisory committee um, with equal representation throughout all of um, the stakeholders. And um, we went forward with getting them um, on to a committee so that they can meet and, and share ideas and, and um, make recommendations to the board. Um, we did attempt to make this meeting happen in April, but it was in person at that point and we could not establish a quorum, even with a smaller number. We had dropped it down to a membership of 15 and we could not get a quorum in person, even with a membership of 15. Um, and so we were looking for eight people and we couldn't get eight people in. So um, now we will um, do these remotely. We did get a um, great turnout um, remotely. We're still recruiting some positions into this group, but we were able to hold a meeting. This was um, because it was um, newly reestablished with another committee membership makeup and um, term limits uh, and a charter. Um, that is really what was kind of the um, majority focus of the entire meeting. So uh, we looked at um, welcome and introductions. We did um, uh, appoint a chair and a vice chair and the chair of the NEWAC committee is Garrett Cham. And um, the vice chair is, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on the vice chair. The vice chair was actually a previous board member and I'm blanking on the name, I'm so sorry. I will, um, I think it has been updated on our website. So let me just check on that really quick. Um, but they were all very happy to, um, to have that vice chair. It was Jennifer, um, sorry, Janine Graves um, was uh, appointed as the vice chair to work with Garrett Chan. And so um, those will be the two people that will be leading the NEWAC committee. Um, they did vote on um, dates, uh, meeting dates as well. And then their one really substantive um, uh, agenda item was to review um, the update to 16 CCR 1410.5, the one that you guys voted on and accepted just earlier, um, where they did provide some very valuable feedback and we did some edits based on their feedback and brought it forth in front of the board for you guys. So um, I'm very happy to get this up and going. Um, just for the board members um, information, this committee is now part of our sunset bill. It will be, um, when our sunset bill passes, it will be a statutorily required committee. And um, one of the um, requests is, is that at least one meeting is dedicated to education and another meeting is dedicated to um, workforce. And that way there is equal voice 
um, and it carries out what our um, legislative uh, staff recommended in 2017, which is the combining of workforce and education, because it is imperative that they get the feedback from each other. And so um, happy to help facilitate that and really um, pleased with the chair and vice chair positions that have been filled by those members. Any questions? Okay, seeing no questions, um, this was information <laughs> only. So we don't need a first and a second or a motion. We can go ahead and open this up to public comment. Board moderator, could you open up to public comment? We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in the request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box. I would like to make a comment. Please remember you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Board E.O. Melby, there are no public requests for comments. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, please. Thank you. Board moderator, is Tracy Montez in the attendees? No, ma'am, she is not. Okay, thank you. I did send her an email but I do have her report out that I can go ahead and, and report out. So um, there is no uh, vote required. There is no motion. So we can move on to 7.2 after taking um, public comment. So 7.2, it was um, going to be presented by Tracy Montes. Um, she is the um, chief of the Division of Programs and Policy Review for the um, Office of Professional Examination Services. She has been working um, under contract with um, the BRN to um, review the um, uh, national certification exams to make a recommendation on whether or not the um, uh, transition of practice that is outlined in AB 890 um, that the board needs to develop regulations for would need an additional examination. Um, the, the timeline in the um, statute is that OPES has until January 1, 2023 to make their recommendation. Um, and it is my understanding and what Samantha Gambles Farr um, reported out as well is that um, uh, they would have that recommendation to us by no, uh, the November board meeting. So I'm very excited and looking forward to that. Um, I did just hear back from Tracy Montez and it looks like Heidi Lincer will be reporting. Can you see if she is available in um, the attendees board moderator? I do see her there. So if you can elevate her, that would be fantastic. So we will hear an information only presentation from Heidi Lincer and she will let them know, let us know just kind of where we are in the process and um, what to expect for the future. Heidi? This is Heidi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Yes. Good morning. Thank you. Tracy asked me to um, fill in for her today, and I am the chief of the Office of Professional Examination Services. And um, as you heard um, earlier by the report by Samantha Gambles, OPS has been working with um, the BRN to conduct a study as mandated by AB 890. We've been um, conducting, uh, we've conducted an occupational analysis of nurse practitioners, and we've also performed a psychometric review 
of the nurse practitioner certification exams. So at this point, the occupational analysis is complete. And as Samantha reported, um, the findings, the report on that will be released in November. And we have also completed the psychometric review of the um, 11 ex uh, certification exams. And those um, findings and recommendations are going to be um, communicated out to the certification providers for purposes of verifying that our findings are accurate. And that's gonna happen in the next few weeks. And once that um, verification is complete, uh, the, the reports will be finalized. And as rep was reported earlier, OPS will, OPS will provide a memo and a presentation summarizing the recommendations at the November uh, advisory committee meeting. And we'll also release uh, the report of the occupational analysis. Are there any questions? Heidi, this is Betty. I do have a question about the, uh, are you looking specifically at finding a certification exam, one in California only, but there's a lot of certification exams right now out there, but what are you trying to accomplish with the certification exam? Finding one for everybody or? We, we are reviewing the ones that are currently accepted by the board. So we have reviewed 11 uh, uh, certification exams that are currently accepted by the BRA. Um, this is Reza. So if I understood the question correctly, I'll, I'll try to add to that. So um, business professions code 2837.105 is the part that um, explicitly directs the board to work with, <clears throat> excuse me, OPES. And um, it, the, the current national NP certification exams test for, you know, a certain set of core competencies. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So what that business professions code section directs us to do is look at the new um, functions that nurse practitioners 103s and 104s will be able to do without standardized procedures and evaluate whether the competencies necessary to do all of that safely are adequately tested for by the current exams or whether a supplemental exam is needed to kind of fill in those gaps. Um, that, that's what the occupational analysis that OPES was working on is, is um, aimed at and the subsequent assessment of, kind of whether the core competencies tested for and necessary align or uh, again, whether some gaps need to be filled in. Hope that helps. So so there could be more than one certification exam that's accepted at some point. That so I'll, I'll try to provide additional clarification with that. Um, the current certification exams now are accepted by the board for licensure. What the evaluation is, is to see if those certification exams will establish a competency to allow for the 103 and the 104 NPs to practice without standardized procedures. If that is deemed that those certification exams do test for that competency, that baseline, and that um, everything is met, there is nothing more that the board will have to do. The nurse practitioners, when they want to work as a 103 and a 104, as long as they have their national certification, meet the other transition of practice requirements that have been established in regulation by the board, can go ahead and move forward to that um, in the pathway to independent practice by becoming a 103 and then a 104. If when OPES completes their review, they've identified those gaps that Reza has mentioned that might exist, um, that those national certifications do not test to ensure the minimum competency and the minimum of safe practicing care then based on those recommendations, the board will have to identify and develop a supplemental exam. It will not be a national certification. It'll be a separate exam um, developed by the board that will be administered to the nurse practitioners in addition to completing their transition of practice requirements to validate that that minimum competency and that safe practice can be achieved. Um, and then they would have to pass that exam as well as having their national certification exam. 
to be able to practice independently in California. So it is a very um, large ask for the Office of Professional Examination Services to do, and there's a lot riding on the outcome of this. I, I guarantee you that we've heard from our stakeholders for nurse practitioners that they don't believe that there is an additional exam needed, that their national certification establishes that minimum competency, um, and we will await a final decision on whether or not OPS agrees with that. Um, and if there is evidence that supports that, the board will move forward without an exam. If there's evidence that identifies gaps, we will do develop an exam that specifically tests on those gaps identified that would then allow for um, the NP applicant to um, sit for and take that exam and upon sex successful completion, progress to a 103 NP. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question, Lori. How did the board determine which uh, national certification exams were acceptable for licensure? So that is done through a lot of stakeholder involvement. Um, and so again, that was also done through OPS. And so with the Nurse Practitioner Advisory Committee, with the Advanced Practice Advisory Committee that was established prior to the Nurse Practitioner Advisory Committee, there's been a lot of input around that. Um, and regulations were developed and that has moved forward based on that stakeholder input to, de to determine which um, national certifications are in alignment and required. Any additional questions? Okay, thank you. Seeing no additional questions, we don't need a motion or a second. We can go out um, as this is information only, so we can go out for public comment. Board moderator? We will be opening for public comment now. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Please. <laughs> Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment. Please remember, you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Board E.O. Melby, there are no public requests for comments. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, please. Thank you. And since this was no information only, we don't need a vote and we can move on to agenda item 7.3. Um, board moderator, can you elevate Mitchell Erickson, please? He is in the attendees and he will be reporting out on this. Um, so just for some background on agenda item 7.3, we held a board meeting where there was, um, as always, in the front of every board meeting, um, items for public comment for items not on the agenda or requests for future agenda. And so there was a public commenter that came in and requested some information on home health services um, regarding CMS, regarding nurse practitioner um, and um, clinical nurse specialist practice. Um, and she wanted this to be brought up and discussed at a future board. So I believe our board president was one that made a motion to add this to a future board agenda. And um, here we are at 7.3, providing that update um, per the stakeholders request. So we did go ahead and um, request for uh, Garrett Chan originally to come in and present this because he was the one that presented this, um, requested this to be presented at the APRN committee meeting. Um, but he had something come up and um, graciously Mitchell Erickson accepted to stand in in his place with not a lot of preparation. So um, thank you, Mitch, for coming in at the last minute and um, agreeing to give an update to our board and our stakeholders 
on um, nurse practitioners and clinical nurse specialist ability to um, work with um, CMS and order um, home health home care services. Thank you, everyone, and I will echo earlier comments about thanking everyone on the board for their contributions to um, to nursing practice and public safety. Um, so I'm the chair of the APR and advisory committee, and we exist at the discretion of all of you. And um, part of our role is to advise the practice committee and and consequently the board on uh, issues or um, advisories that affect all APRN professions, as well as those that are unique to CRNAs and CNSs, um, just because of the existence of the Nurse Midwifery um, Practice Committee, as well as the NPAC. So this particular um, item um, had come up actually several times, not just the one that was for this particular situation, and it revolved around a change that um, occurred in 2020 as a result of the CARES Act. And what it did was it changed um, CMS um, regulatory amendment chapter seven um, that had to do with the Medicare benefit um, policy manual. And what it did was it extended the ability of uh, and nurse practitioners as well as clinical nurse um, specialists as well as physician assistants um, to both certify and recertify home health services. Um, just as a caveat, <clears throat> as a provider, you wouldn't be able to order these services um, from an agency specifically in which you would hold a financial interest, which would be a conflict of interest. Um, so, um, but you can certainly provide these services. And this is separate from the provision of um, telecommunication um, services to an individual patient who um, is provided by you as the provider. So these are separate things, but um, certainly within the CARES Act, there was um, a provision that allowed um, uh, these services to provide be provided remotely um, to patients. And a lot of that came from as a result of obviously COVID, but, um, but also to address uh, the lack of um, access to patients in more rural settings. Um, the, there's nothing um, within this that um, goes beyond the ability to um, order the service. Um, I will say that part of what was asked was the existence of this within a standardized procedure or not. Um, as some of you may recall, back in 2009, there was um, a change to the Business and Professions Code 2835.7 which authorized MPs to order home care services at that time, but it existed under a standardized procedure. And given that um, we are going through the regulatory process uh, language for AB 890, um, that still exists. So the requirement that there may be some debate amongst different um, legal opinion, but um, for the purposes of this discussion, I think it's just best to, um, per the, the FAQ on the BRN website, that this privilege um, exists within a standardized procedure for now. Um, and so it doesn't, um, I, I guess I'll add a little bit more about, um, about the billing process, because I believe that was one of the other um, issues. And I don't know that this is really the right forum to discuss the scope of Medicare billing process because it's incredibly complex and it also changes on because they file a new report on billing process every single week. So every seven days there's a new process. So um, it's um, mind boggling for you as a provider to actually read all of that um, report that comes out every seven days. So, but I will say that um, although the comment period has ended, it actually ended yesterday, um, there is a, a, an act that was passed, it was called the Post-Acute Care Transformation um, Act, which came out in 2014, or IMPACT. And what that 
requires was that there was a report to Congress around um, a unified payment process for um, home for uh, post acute care in which home care services ordering um, falls into. There are actually four of the PAC components. One is skilled nursing, one is um, inpatient rehab facilities, one is long-term care hospitals, and the other is home health agencies. So just to know that there's this push for 2023 that the billing process would be unified across all four of those settings um, utilizing the characteristics and ICD-10 codes for patients' um, medical conditions that guide the billing process rather than having a, um, a prospective payment system or um, Medicare fee-for-service system for each of those entities separately. It would unify all of those and it's really based on the patient rather than the setting. Um, but just for people to understand in the future that that will probably come in 2023. And I am happy to answer any questions or comments um, regarding this particular issue. So this, um, this particular FAQ was clarified and it may need to be um, redone, of course, um, after the regulatory process for AB 90 is completed. I will add one other comment to that there was the clinical nurse uh, midwives um, were not included in this federal regulation to their chagrin. Um, we're not quite sure how that was omitted or over, overlooked um, and they are working on that at the federal level to kind of revise that amendment. Thank you, that's fantastic information. Um, we did update our website. Um, you can search this document under CARES Act, if that's what you're familiar with, but you can also search the document by typing in um, the home care services as well, so that it will pop up either way. We did include kind of where you can kind of go through and find it within our documents. If a nurse practitioner is needing it to reference, if they're um, hitting any kind of barriers to being able to provide this service. And so um, we did, uh, through the Advanced Practice um, Advisory Committee, develop the FAQs, receive edits. They did rec make a recommendation as a group to accept them. And um, we did add that to our website for ease. So um, hopefully um, with this presentation that is um, uh, recorded and put on webcast and onto YouTube and um, attached to our meeting minutes along with this um, FAQ and information that um, the nurse practitioners and clinical nurse specialists will have this to refer back to um, for reference if they need anything in the future for this. So thank you Mitch again for coming in at the last minute. I really, really appreciate that um, and uh, hopefully um, we can continue these report outs and really uh, appreciate the uh, information that our advisory committees give to us. Um, if there's any questions from the board, we can take that. If not, we can go out to public comment because this is information item only and does not require a vote or a motion or a second. Okay, no comment. Um, seeing no comment, uh, board moderator, we open up to public comment, please. We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box, I would like to make a comment. Please remember you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform me that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment.
Board E.O. Melby, there are no public requests for comments. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, please. And again, since this was information only, we will not need a vote. And we can move on to agenda item 8.0, report of the Education Licensing Committee. Um, can we elevate Dr. Marianne McCarthy and Hovita? We will turn over the next section to you. Good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Jovita Dominguez. I'm chairing the Education and Licensing Committee. And um, I would um, also um, request that uh, Marianne um, help me um, get it started. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. This is Marianne McCarthy. I am a supervising nursing education consultant and also the liaison to the Education and Licensing Committee. Um, I want to first start with um, some information to let you know that agenda items 8.1 all the way through 8.2.8, um, with the exception of two progress report additions, and progress reports are the consent agenda list, and I'm going to speak to those in just a second. Um, all the rest, everything else besides the two things that I'm going to talk to you about on these consent agenda item, have gone to the ELC committee. Um, all were approved by the committee, and the votes are listed on your agenda to see um, how that played out in the ELC committee uh, last, let's see, when was it? In June. Once I inform you about these two progress report consent items, um, you as a group can decide to take all of the agenda items together and vote them, vote for them, or you can, of course, pull any of them out for further board discussion. So if you could look on your packet on page 11, I believe that's where the progress report list comes up in the ELC materials, Education and Licensing Committee materials, um, in your materials packet on the list. And um, the first two you're gonna see that I added are two programs that had submitted a letter of intent. So, what this means is that if someone decides they want to start a new program, brand new, and they want to go through the feasibility study process, they send us a letter of intent, and then they go through the process. Um, and, and you can see in the right-hand column the reference to the EDP I-01 and 16 CCR 1421. Um, about That's where the timeline comes in. So they send a letter of intent. If they don't meet the timeline, in other words, they didn't act on it. They just sent us a letter of intent, but didn't really act on it. Um, after a year's time, there seemed to be a, there's, they are deemed to be abandoned. Um, we did reach out to people um, because of COVID, and we did uh, give extra time because of COVID. Um, however, these two programs at this point um, have abandoned the process. So this is just an FYI letting you know that these two have abandoned. And of course, at any time, they could resubmit a letter of intent and go back through the process again, should they decide to. So those are the only two things that didn't go to ELC. Um, so they're the only two things that were added. Again, it's just a FYI. So the board is updated as to um, what is happening when we have these programs that, um, for some reason, and I'm guessing maybe COVID couldn't continue at the time, um, that they'll be placed on this progress reports list. Other than that, all the items in 8.1, all the way through 8.2.8, .8, did go to ELC. All were voted um, to be approved. And um, I will leave it up to our chair and the board to determine what your next steps will be. Thank you. So to provide further information, um, a motion can be made to accept the entirety. And we can go out to public comment. Um, on any of those items um, and in there and receive public comment on it. So um, it is up to the board if they want to pull something out and have additional conversation. If not, um, I would like to request a motion. Um, I, does anybody in, uh, other than myself, I um, would like to make the motion, but I'd like to also hear from the other board members on their thoughts and concerns if they have any. No concerns, Jovita, and I was uh, hoping to, for it to be moved as well. 
Yeah. Same here. No concerns. I'd like to make a motion um, to accept the um, the education um, the recommendations of the Education Licensing Committee and approve the agenda for 8.1.1 through 8.2.8. I will second that. Thank you. Was that... Um, Dolores was, that, was the second. Oh, thank you, Vice uh, President. Um, thank you. Um, then I believe we go to um, public comment. Yes, correct. We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box. I would like to make a comment. Please remember you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Committee Chair Dominguez, there are no public requests for comment. Would you like me to close this window? Please, thank you. So I'd like to um, vote yes on the motion. Um, President Trujillo? Trujillo votes yes. Uh, Vice President um, Mary Fagan? Mary Fagan, yes. Um, Susan Naranjo? Susan votes yes. Trisha Wynn? Yes. And um, David Lawler? David Lawler, yes. And um, forgive me for our new... Um, Vicky our Granowitz, new yes. Vicky Granowitz, thank you so much. Um, motion carries. Thank you oh, so Vicky, much. Get Betty Woods. Oh, so sorry, Betty, Betty, yeah. Betty. How can I forget? Thank you. I apologize, Betty. Betty? Uh, I vote yes. Yes. Thank you. I believe motion carries now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Agenda item 8.3 is the um, NCLEX update, which is an information only item. This information can be found in your material packet on page 81. The NCLEX report is included in your materials packet for your review. This is an information only ag agenda item. And there are no changes in the report for California at this time. Any board members um, have any questions or statements? Okay, um, board moderator, would you take us to public comment? We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box. I would like to make a comment. Please remember, you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform you that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in, I would like to make a comment. Committee Chair Dominguez, there are no public requests or comments. Would you like me to close this window? Please, thank you. 
Agenda item 8.4. This is the licensing unit update. Again, um, the report is included in your materials packet on page 86. Um, this is an information only agenda item. Items of significance um, were addressed in the EO report. So I um, actually didn't address specific ones in our EO report like I typically do this time. So I did wanna make sure um, that you, if you guys have questions that we can go over them. Um, there were um, updates to our California Graduate Nursing Program Director Portal. Um, and so with that, uh, we kind of talked about it a little bit in the NPAC and NMAC updates where the um, furnishing license is now being able to be updated um, through the grad portal as well as the California approved nursing programs for the nurse practitioner and the nurse midwives. Um, the one that I didn't mention um, was the public health nurse certificate that is mentioned in here and that has been added to the portal as well. Um, for all of our California approved programs that have completed a document called the EDP 17. Based on that document, they um, provide a uh, proof of meeting the requirements for the public health nurse certificate on the conferment of their bachelor's degree or their entry level master's degree. Um, and that information will now be um, held in our Breeze system. And if they were to apply in the future, they will pull that information from their initial licensing application called the 4001, pull that over and meet that education requirement. And so that's um, a uh, really great update that has recently been rolled out. Um, and it does not require an additional submission for those California board approved schools if in like 10 years, a um, person that graduated from a school that had this um, curriculum approved um, submits an application, it'll pull that information over. And as long as it was BRN approved, then um, they will be issued, excuse me, issued that public health nurse certificate. That is something we've been able to do through the um, California grad process because all of our schools are BRN approved and the nursing education consultants do all of the front work for our licensing unit in the beginning. So our nursing education consultants approve every single curriculum change for all of the pre licensure nursing programs, the nurse midwifery programs and the nurse practitioner programs, as well as verifying that the public health nursing um, curriculum meets all board requirements. That way, when an application applies, we do not require their transcript and there does not have to be a transcript review. Um, and that really expedites the process on the back end. It's been a huge, huge improvement and really just grateful for all the work that the NECs have done to make this come to fruition, as well as our licensing staff updating, working tirelessly to get the kinks worked out and um, really training the deans and directors on how to manage through these upgrades. So um, thank you guys very much for working together to get that done. Additionally, as you guys know, we went live with the nurses for license verifications um, in March. And so with that, um, all of our license verifications have been managed through that system. We're hearing really great feedback. We are continuing to work with NCSBN and nurses on cleaning up some of the data. The data that was housed in the CAS system prior to going to Breeze um, is requiring some updates to get it into the Breeze system to transfer over. And so that is um, where we're receiving some feedback on some of those earlier licensees that they're not able to use the uh, verification process through nurses um, at this point. So we are working on data patches and getting that cleaned up and moving for that. We will also eventually be moving to nurses for the APRN license certification certifications um, verifications out as well. And um, so we started that work. Um, we are meeting with NCSBN to um, kind of find out what needs to be transmitted over to them so that they can um, go ahead and assist us in that verification process too. So really looking forward to all of those updates. Um, and then there are, of course, statistics proven, um, sorry, discovers, discussed in there. And then I want to call attention to the um, final tables. These tables have been updated as a request of our board members to get a little more information. 
we have licensing processing times on our website and it talks about um, what it is from initial receipt of application to the first review. Now that makes sense from a business standpoint if all of the applicants have submitted data in their entirety and it's complete. If we receive a complete application on that initial review, a license can be issued. What becomes problematic is there's a deficiency period. Once that deficiency period is um, entered, it is up to the applicant to submit the information that is missing. Earlier, we talked about the addition of 1410.5 and um, having to require some nurses to go back to school to clear their deficiencies. That can take years. Um, and so there is a deficient period that is managed by the applicant on submitting those required documents. And so that can be as simple as we send an email out and they submit that document within five minutes. But it could also be as lengthy as a year, two years, or three years, depending on what the deficiency is of that application. We try hard at the BRN to not deny licensure, but to let them know what is needed so that they can obtain licensure and give them the grace time to give us the information so that that uh, primary source data can be verified and a license can then be issued. And so there is a, a new table here that talks about what the from receipt of application is until licensure is issued. And we have removed the time period that is that deficiency time period so that hopefully you guys will get a better understanding of truly how long it takes our board staff to complete the work for licensure. And so this is um, different information. Additionally, we've always reported out California schools, US schools and international schools separately. So we continue that. But previously, the uh, APRNs were, were reported out as a singular item. And so our licensing staff did separate out the APRN section so that you can see for each license type the um, averaging processing times. You will notice that they did uh, talk about the fiscal year 2020 to 2021 and then the fiscal year 2021 to 2022. And you will see an overall decrease in timeline um, for the majority that go through. There is a couple day increase in um, both international and US for um, review of application and processing through. And I'd like to address that increase. It's not that our board staff is um, not doing the work. It's that um, in re direct relation to our fund report that you guys received, our endorsement applications have skyrocketed. We have so many nurses coming into California. Last year, we had about 20,000 nurses coming into California. This most recent year's numbers are pushing up to 40,000. Um, and so it just increasing by, you know, 10,000 applicants each year definitely increases um, the workload, but our, our licensing staff has managed it very well. We are um, not by any state saying that we are perfect in this. We are continuing to find efficiencies. Um, the Enlightened License Project has a lot of recommendations and we're continuing to look forward to implementing those over the next year. Um, if you have any questions or anything, we are here and available, but no vote is required. And if there are no board questions or any discussion on the licensing update, then we can go out to public comment. Lori, I'd like to thank you once um, many times because I, I appreciate that you're constantly working at the deficiencies to improve the process. I know that um, in a whole, you know, we hear a lot of negative out in the community and in the state, but I so appreciate you always trying to find a way to um, better the system. Thank you. We have a lot of work to do, but we're working on it. Thank you. Laura, just, just for clarity, I'm looking at the tables that you talked about. So the, the on page 88, the first one, the average processing time, 
that's that's the total or is that just once the application has been approved and it's complete? I just want to make sure I'm understanding. So up above, it talks about um, receipt of application to licensure minus the deficiency period. So it is the total time previously. And what's reported out on our website is um, receipt to initial review. And a lot of times that initial review ends with a licensing being issued because if the application is complete, we'll issue a license right there. This is the reporting out structure that we really wanted to look at when addressing deficiencies. There was that NPR report that came out that kind of showed California in a negative light. And we wanted to make sure that we address that and really gave you guys some solid statistical information in there. Now, I will uh, be completely transparent that deficiency time period is still a problem for our board. We will continue to work with that. There are some times that like within our um, uh, APRN population is we require primary source data from the national certifying bodies. And that means that like ANCC has to send the information directly to the BRN, not send it to their cert certification holder and then have that certification holder submitted to us. It's very similar to a transcript. We can't accept a transcript from an applicant. We have to accept the transcript from the school or through a transcript service. So sometimes that application is received. That request of that information has been requested by the applicant and the application is reviewed prior to us receiving that information from the primary source data. So um, it crosses. Now, when it crosses like that, the applicant has in their mind says, I've turned it in, it's there. Why is the board not looking at it? And that's because the board did the initial review already. Now it will take a second time around. So it's, it's a double processing that has to happen. And so we run reports daily to find any new information that's been sent to the board. And then they process that in time received, right? So it's the ones received earlier get processed sooner than the ones received later. That becomes problematic for the applicant that receives the email deficiency and five minutes later they submit the data because they felt like it only took me five minutes to submit the data. Well, we have hundreds of thousands of licensees that have done the same thing. And so we're reviewing them in, in time received, right? So what we're really looking at with this endorsement process is the requirement of all of those additional items, the primary source data items. Can we condense that? Can we find an alternative method to get that information and not have it ex as extensive as it is for um, people to submit that data? So one of the things that is up for consideration and it would require some regulatory or statutory change would be evaluating the method two process for our advanced practice nurses. Method two requires that national certification. That national certification is not granted until that national certifying body says you have met the education and practice experience. We additionally require proof that they've met the education experience. So on face value, just kind of cracking that open, you have two bodies that are primary source data requiring that education information twice. So maybe that's something that we can look at at statute later on or regulation later on that says we don't need the education information, all of those multiple transcripts for advanced practice if they have a national certification because that national certifying body has already validated that for us and we can take their word for it. They send us over the primary source document that would remove all of those transcripts that we currently collect on the advanced practice nurse practitioners and nurse midwives. So that might speed that process up and require less deficiencies. And those are some of the things that we're looking at with that. Um, the other requirement was to combine the um, applications for nurse practitioner, nurse midwife, and the furnishing application. And that was language that has been added to our sunset bill. So when that passes, that is absolutely something that our board will pursue to really speed up that process, streamline it, decrease the cost to the applicant, and hopefully see our numbers continue to improve. 
Is there any opportunity for the board to reach out to the certifying organization and get and verify the primary source that way? I'm thinking of now the way that we in the hospital we verify licensure by going on to Breeze, right? Could we go to the AACN and just see find their information and say, boom, they're certified instead of having them have to send it in? That is absolutely something we're exploring. That was one of the brainstorming sessions that came up. We do that right now through nurses with our NCSBN, right, partnership. And we do that for all license val validations. And so our licensing team has access to nurses. They sign in, they pull up the applicant's information. They have that license verification right there as primary source. It would be fantastic if these certifying bodies establish that same process. That's not there yet, but we are reaching out to them. We are having conversations with them. And another kind of happenstance is we have those contact information from the OPES review that NPAC um, uh, and the passing of AB 890 has been working on. So with those relationships built, we will continue to pursue that. I think that would be fantastic. And yes, Mary, we will. We are absolutely working on that as a next level. Um, really kind of looking to cut that down. One of the other things that we've done and that was in the strategic plan is we've received a contract and working on a second contract for the e-transcript e systems that are out there. And that will allow us to receive the electronic transcripts from the various schools in a much more efficient manner. So um, a lot of things that we're looking at here on how we can do to expedite this process and decrease the amount of deficiencies so that we don't have to go into that deficiency period and we don't have to touch the application the second time that it can be approved one and done. That's fantastic. And then the only other comment I really wanted to make, and it goes back to the um, to the licensing applications received. So in the fiscal year, that licensures by endorsement 38,000 up for 23,000 the year before. And I, I know um, a lot of those are not people who are moving to California. They're traveling nurses who are coming here to help out during the pandemic and then are gonna go back. So I again wanna put out there for our consideration of joining the nursing compact, because if we join the nursing compact and these nurses aren't looking to relocate permanently to California, then all of those applications would not have to be um, you know, follow your staff would not be having to process all of those applications, right? I, I definitely hear that, but when so just to play devil's advocate, um, there is a process that's used to validate that they meet the same standards as as the rest of our nurses here. And so that would not happen without it going through that endorsement process. So there are risks and benefits to each side. The compact has a lot of benefits, but not following the endorsement process may also have some risk. And so I know that's something that our board has um, considered in the past. I know it will continue to come through in future legislative sessions. And um, as part of the strategic plan, Mary, um, you did request to have some data collected, and we are working to get that data collected so that we can make an evidence-based decision on that compact. The other thing is it's not um, truly just endorsement traveling nurses. We do get a lot of telehealth providers that are coming in, and of course they cannot provide any care to our patients here in California without being licensed as an RN in California and without meeting the same licensing standards that are our licensed RNs do if they were doing in-person care here. And so that is another pathway that is used for those endorsement apps. And we do have a very large military population in California. So we do have people coming into California, endorsing in and staying for the assignment length of six months, one year, three years. And some of us like, like the state enough that we choose to stay. So um, I know I'm a transplant um, and I thought I was only gonna be here to go to school and leave and I'm here 20 some years later. So um, I, I love having the various abilities to have our license come in. And yes, there are benefits to the compact, but there are also benefits to our endorsement process. So I'm excited to get the evidence so that we can make a decision based on that. Thank you, Mary. Is there any other board members that have um, statements or concerns? Seeing none, 
So then, um, board moderator, would you please take us to public comment? We will be opening for public comment now. I will be activating the question and answer feature. Please refer to the screen share for members of the public to see how they should type in their request for comment. I've activated the question and answer feature. Members of the public can indicate that they would like to make a comment by typing into the question box. I would like to make a comment. Please remember you will have two minutes to make your comments. I will not give a reminder as your time approaches. I do not want to interrupt you nor cause you to lose your train of thought. I will mute your microphone and inform me that your time has expired and we'll move on to the next member of the public. I'll pause for a moment for members of the public to type in. I would like to make a comment. Committee Chair Dominguez, there are no public requests for comments. Would you like me to close this window? Yes, thank you. Uh, Jovita, before we go to a vote, um, I would like to also remind everyone that the governor's order, um, his executive order that let EMSA bring in out-of-state personnel um, actually worked very well for us. And we we have a lot of nurses, it sounds like, I mean, close to 40,000 that are coming in out of state um, to be licensed. So um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of assistance coming in to be licensed and that should help our hospital industry. All right, we can take it to a vote. Real, thank you. Real quick, Dolores. Is, is information only, so a vote is not required. Oh, and then just for our great. new board members to understand what the EMSA provisions were, um, I would like to take a minute to explain that. Um, when the uh, state of emergency was declared um, through one of the orders that the governor um, ordered, the, he opened up the provision for out-of-state providers, um, that's right. nurse midwives, nurse practitioners, RNs, LVN or LV, LPNs, psychiatric technicians, um, certified nurse um, uh, assistants, et cetera, social workers to come in from out of state and assist in our state of emergency to provide services. Um, that was done outside of the BRN. So what that did is opened up a separate state agency they managed those inquiries. They managed um, the, the bringing in and contracting of, of those providers. What occurs is those are facility led and not individual led. So say you have hospital A that contacts EMSA and says, I need 50 providers. Then EMSA would pair 50 providers with hospital A. And when the state of emergency ends, they would let hospital A know the state of emergency has ended, EMSA is no longer in authority, and the hospital would then remove those 50 providers from their staffing and um, not allow them to continue to practice in California because they're not licensed here. In the meantime, while those providers are here working with that specific entity, that hospital association or other healthcare organizations that's using them, they can pursue a temporary license through California or endorse completely into California and become licensed here through the BRN so that if and when that state of emergency ends, they can continue to practice in California. We have launched a big social media campaign to let hospitals, healthcare providers, as well as individuals understand that um, the EMSA provisions are not permanent and that they will um, expire with the state of emergency and that if they do choose to continue to work and provide the services they've been doing in California to please apply for endorsement into California through the BRN. Um, as part of that um, discipline, any kind of complaint on these nurses, any kind of errors that have occurred um, that have caused harm or need investigated will not come through the BRN. We get noticed of them in case there's a pending application 
um, that a, a complaint has been filed or that um, this person can no longer practice in our state. But we do not handle the discipline of these nurses or other providers in um, that are working here that have um, committed some kind of um, a violation of the Nursing Practice Act. So um, those are handled through EMSA and those are typically handled by the states that do they do have licensure in. And so again, that is a complete process that is outside of the BRN. And um, so just to provide some clarification on what EMSA is and how it served during um, the state of emergency. So again, um, back to both Dolores's point and uh, Mary Fagan's point is we will be collecting data. We will be um, getting data from the other 50 states, other 49 states, sorry, and four territories. And um, we, per our strategic plan, will bring that information to the board and our board can make um, an evidence-based decision on whether or not um, a compact, a uh, nursing compact is something that we would want to join. Currently, 39 states have joined the compact. Um, there are 11 states that are not um, part of the compact. And what is being said by NCSBN is that the 11 states that are holdouts are states that are um, highly represented by their unions. Knowing that unions are set up to represent the nurses, um, I'm trying to find out what are they seeing that maybe we're not seeing. Why are um, the unions fighting for their nurses to say this is not what we want um, in those 11 states? So I have reached out. And as soon as I get that data and we have that compiled, I do have till 2025, thank goodness, because it is quite a robust project. We will be able to bring that back and we'll be able to make a, a, an educated decision based on fact on whether or not California proceeds to um, continue as is or whether or not California decides to join the compact. So thank you guys very much. Thank you for the explanation. I remembered reading about the change, but I didn't understand that it created a parallel track. And certainly it's a good example of the unintended consequences of trying to do something good. Thank you. Thank you, Lori, for that um, well-organized um, information. Um, before we conclude with um, 8.0, I do want to mention that um, for the ELAC uh, materials that we were given, I wanted to say um, that I, I was happy to see that some of the new employees um, that, they're that they have already um, hired or will be hiring were actually ELAC um, uh, graduates, which is is nice because they, they've they already gone through the course, they work in the community. I would believe that they work in the community and hopefully that'll strengthen the ELAC's um, progress. Um, I just wanted to make that comment before we concluded 8.0 and I, I apologize for not making it when we actually went through that material. And Marianne, thank you so much for assisting me. No problem, Pavita. So um, Dolores, I believe now we can go to 9.0. So instead of going to 9.0, we did get a board member request for a yeah. lunch break at this point. And so um, board president, I believe we're gonna break for lunch between yes, 12 and one o'clock, is that correct? Yes. We will okay. come back and continue the meeting. Um, starting with 9.0, I believe. Yes, agenda item 9.0 oh. is the report of the Enforcement, Enforcement Intervention, Intervention Committee. Committee. Um, Patricia Wynn and her newly appointed chairperson role will um, spearhead through that. And then um, we will additionally then move to our legislation update um, immediately to follow that and then go into closed session. So um, making our way through this very long board meeting. Um, and we'll see you guys at one o'clock. Enjoy your lunch. See you at one. Thank you.